Hi, I'm Jan Harrell from Houston, Texas. I'm an enamelist, a metalsmith, and a teacher. And today we're going to do a wonderful technique called wet packing. It's an enameling technique and it produces wonderful results on etched and roller printed material. These are the three pieces that we're going to be emulating today. There's one that has a patina on it. And this is a true champlevé because it has exposed metal on the top with an inlay of glass down in the recesses. This is wet packed with another color on the bottom and then enamel over the top. So this is a boss tie. And the last one is just plain boss tie on top of the beautiful textured material here that's at Cool Tools. They're all done in fine silver and I'm going to show in a later video how to do this beautiful tubing rivet that really makes the piece uh, sing. For today, we're going to be using the sifters to grade sift our enamels. We have a few wet packing tools, a brush, uh, part of the textured material that I sawed out today for the demo, a tray to hold our wet enamels in, uh, some color charts, which are always good when you're working on silver because you want it to look really good because it costs a lot of money and you need to make it a very beautiful product, some Q-tips and some water. So let's get started. There are two schools of thought on enamel preparation. One is to grade sift and the other is to wash. For this particular technique, I'm going to use a combination of both. These enamels that are beautiful directly on top of fine silver need to be grade sifted. Now what do we say that is? That is to eliminate the fines. The fines are the very small particles that discolor enamel, they make it cloudy, uh, it could be factory waste, but those need to be eliminated so you have a really beautiful clear enamel, especially on top of fine silver. So in a previous video I showed you how to grade sift and I just want to show you these large sifters. I have a 100 mesh and a 200 mesh in here and for the purposes of today that's all I need. The minute I get a quantity of enamel in and I know that I'm going to use it only for you know the pretty jewel like techniques I will dump all of the enamel into the top with a quarter in here and another one in the bottom. I'll put my mask on because there's uh, particulates that are in the air when you're doing this process. I'll also put the lid and the catch pan on the bottom and this really keeps it uh, very clean in your studio. So you're just going to sift and you'll end up with two different layers of enamel. Depending on how fine the detail is in the print that I've got, I can use the 100 mesh for bigger open areas or the 200 mesh for smaller areas that I need the grains to be able to get down into the particles. And you'll see that when I wet pack in just a few minutes. So we've grade sifted the enamel, we've put them in jars so they're sealed and the residue of the enamel that falls into the bottom, I usually put it in another jar and it's called counter enamel which is what we put on the back of pieces. If you're work working on very large panels, the clarity of the work is not going to be as important as in a pendant. Uh, so you could really put them back together and use everything. I throw no enamel away. Every bit of it is used for some purpose. So I've got these three colors of blue. They've already been sifted and grade sifted. I've got a tray and I'm going to put a little bit of the enamel in the tray. If you want to you could take a marker and put your color number on here. Sometimes we do it on some disposable spoons and we write the color number on the handle of the spoon. So we just use that spoon every time that we're using 2530 and then we can cover up what's in the spoon with foil and use it over and over again till it's all gone. I 
I do quite a lot of etching in my work, and that gives you a deeper, <clears throat> a deeper contour here than roller printing does. But roller printing is great if you don't want to spend the time etching. It's going to give us a low relief that we will polish down, and then we will have a metal surface, inlaid enamel, and we're going to put a patina on it to get the finished product. So I sawed this out of this sheet earlier today. I've made a hole in the top so we can do that beautiful uh, fine silver rivet that goes in the top. I'm not going to take the time right now to do the counter enamel, but these do need counter enamel on them. When this uh, video is finished, you'll see it with a counter enamel on the back. The counter enamel is really important when you're doing fine silver. Fine silver, I could probably bend this with my fingers. The more it goes in and out of the kill, the more annealed it gets. And that wouldn't be a very good piece to use that's going to hang um, and get a lot of wear, unless you put the counter enamel on the back. The counter enamel is really going to strengthen this piece. Plus, it also gives you the opportunity to have a, a pendant that has completely different information on the back. So we could put a stencil on the back, we could do a silk screen, we could do a scraffito, we could do a lot of things on the back, and this becomes a dual purpose pendant, which I think is pretty cool. Oh, cool tools. <laughs> so I went over to the sink already, and I've used the fiberglass brush. I've degreased this, so I know that I'm going to have um, uh, my little grains of glass are going to go down into these uh, recessed areas. So. I'm kind of lazy when it comes to enameling some things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to get the enamel off of that raised surface because I know eventually when I get enough enamel in these recesses, I'm going to stone the top down. So uh, I'm not going to waste my time doing that. Once again, I'm going to put a surfactant on the piece because when I wet pack, it has a little bit of water in it, and water and metal will bond together a little bit better if we don't have any pooling up. So you see how much I'm putting on, and I'm taking all of it off, but it's just a whisper, a whisper of the surfactant on there. So this piece is ready to go. I'm going to take a pipette and reconstitute my pieces. If I were to leave this out for a long time, I'd want to put a cover on it. Um, you know, there's always stuff in the air, dead bugs and lint, and you want to keep this. This is the enamels that you use for your jewelry pieces that are really pretty. I've also got a waste uh, water here so I can clean my brush out. And I'm going to do a technique called knurling. So this is, uh, I'm going to vibrate the edge of the piece so the enamel will fall down into the recesses. And it's almost anything that has mm, this kind of uh, tooled handle. Maybe you have a nut pick at home. Also, the handles that come with the uh, sifters, that has a great uh, handle on them. So I'm going to start with a darker at the bottom and then go towards light at the top. So this is my darkest color. And as I move across the piece, you can see that I'm not taking a great deal of time keeping it off the top surface because I know that I can take that off later with a diamond tool. This is really wet. I want to encourage the grains to go down into the recesses, so I'm going to knurl the edge. It's nice to have a Q-tip ready to uh, pull some of that water off so you can kind of see what you're doing. So I'm going to work my way across the piece. And by the time this pendant is finished, I would have uh, probably applied maybe three coats of this. I also know that the patina that I'm going to put on this is, is going to make the lines appear black. So the lighter the enamel, the more contrast there will be with the work. So we, we wouldn't put real dark enamels if you were going to do a black patina because they won't show up very well.
When I'm working on a deeply etched piece, I have uh, larger divisions in between the enamel and the metal, so I can be a less messy than I am right now. But right now I'm just trying to get a lot of information in there. I'm going to knurl the edge again. And can you see how it kind of blends those two colors between the two blues? And every time you knurl this piece, more water comes up. So what you're doing is you're eliminating water between each grain of glass, and you're also eliminating the airspace. And that's going to make your enamels more translucent. When you start working with silver, you, you really need to know your colors. Um, and color charts aren't the most fun thing to make but they're kind of a necessary evil here. And then I'll put this last, this is kind of a gray-blue, um, 2625. So Thompson, Thompson enamels have about 20 colors that look really great directly on copper and look really great directly on silver. And those are what you want to use with the roller printed material that Cool Tools has. You don't want to waste putting a flux coat in between the metal and the color because the flux coat will fill in all those undulations and you won't have any beautiful patterning when it goes up and down. So you're trying to fill in with color and not flux. And flux, for those of you who don't know it, it's just a clear coat. It's similar to the last coat of nail polish that you put on so it it keeps the uh, on copper it keeps the red of the copper from coming through a transparent enamel on silver it kinda does the same thing so you want these particular enamels that look great directly on copper I'm gonna knurl it again now I've got a lot of water in this <clears throat> this can't go in the kiln till I've dried it but there you go. Kind of a tri-colored thing. When I do the next coat, I'll overlap the colors so I won't have any line of demarcation between the three colors that I've put on. Let me go put this on the kill to dry. I've put one additional coat of enamel on the front, and I've also put my counter enamel on the back, and I decided to put a little pattern that was different from the front. So this could be a dual-sided pendant. My next thing is to take this boss tie and make it into a champlevé. So the difference between those two techniques, champlevé has exposed metal. So that black patina that you see over on this side is a patina that I'm going to put on. So this is metal and this is all glass. When I do any grinding on glass, I want to be sure I have eye protection and also have on a mask. This is silica, some of it could be lead bearing, though the Thompson line that we're working with today is lead free, but it's always good to uh, take care of those body parts that you don't get a replacement for. So let's go to one way of grinding it would be with a diamond pad. And I would do this underwater and I would be very careful to just take off just the highlights of this piece. But I'm going to speed the process up today and do it on this diamond grinding machine and use some water and we will be done in about five minutes. So through the magic of television, I have ground the top of this down. It took me about five minutes. I did some of it with a diamond pad that is more aggressive, and then I went to the finer tool on the machine. Now, I could choose at this point to leave this pendant exactly like it is, so I would have matte surface and matte enamel. 
But usually I like the contrast between a patinaed area that has kind of a matte finish to it and the shininess of the enamel. So in order to do that, I clean the piece that I have just ground very um, precisely with a toothbrush and scrub it. And then I put this back in the kiln, do a normal one and a half to two minute firing. And that means that my glass will have a shiny finish. And when I put the patina on, I will end up with the result that I have in my other hand. So you will see this later on. Let me show you the back of the piece one more time. And it's completely different from the front. So what a fun combination to have a dual sided pendant. So here is the piece freshly out of the kiln. You can see the shiny glass and you can see the kind of the matte textured silver. If you wanted to and you wanted the silver to be highly polished, you could take this over to a, uh, a buffing machine and you could bring that up to a high polish. But I kind of like the difference between the shiny of the enamel and a little bit of a matte finish. I think the piece reads better that way. So you'll see this piece later on when we do the tubing rivets on the top sections. Now we're going to work on the second pendant out of this series that uses the tubing rivets, the pattern material in fine silver, and some of the great products. One of the, my favorites is the sunshine colors, but in this piece we're not using it to paint over a piece, we're using it to antique the piece. So if you know, uh, if you were of the age where you had antique furniture, you would mush a lot of black around a piece and then you would take the excess off. And that's exactly what we're going to do on this piece. Once again, I'm using a little surfactant. And somebody asked me, can you put on too much? Oh yeah. Uh, if you are adding a lot of foreign ingredients to enamel, you always run the risk of them spoiling the clarity of your piece. And we're working on some expensive pieces of silver. We don't want the enamel to not look as fine as it could. So you saw how little I put on, and then I'm going to take a paper towel and wipe it off. And you don't need gloves on for this. This is not a dangerous product. Uh, it's just surfactant or soap. I have my Sunshine color black here in my tray, and I'm going to add a little bit of water to it to get it to the right consistency. Now, if I were to put this on the fine silver piece without the surfactant on it, this black sunshine color would just bead up and it wouldn't fall down into the crevices. Like the other piece that I worked on, I'm going to put this over the entire piece. I'm going to let it dry on top of the kill and then I'm going to take off the excess. And this is just like I did my old dresser to make it look good one year. I put paint on and mush some dark stuff in the cracks. I let it dry just a little bit and then I took the extra off. So what this does on a roller printed silver piece, it really accentuates the printing that's in there. Um, when we do the third piece out of this series, you just see beautiful texture, but it's not highlighted with this black um, underglaze that's underneath here. So I'm going to put this on top of the kill and we'll wait for that to dry and I'll show you the next step. You can see that the black sunshine color has now dried. It's a nice matte finish on here. If I were to rub this with my finger, because I have skin on my finger still, uh, it would go down in the cracks and we would take too much of it away. So you need a flat stick of some kind and this should work perfectly. It's got a fine grit to it. So I can go over the top of the piece and lightly take a little bit off. Oh, isn't that wonderful? So you could choose to take a little bit more out at the bottom, but I'm just going to take. So the, the sunshine colors, I wouldn't have to use just black in here. I could use a darker blue. I could use any color that I wanted to out of the sunshine. And the perfect, it's the perfect use for it because it is a 425 mesh, finely ground enamel. 
with a really good oxide color in there. So doesn't that really show that texture of the silver underneath there? Show me. Over here. Thank you. So now we're going to put a color on the top. Um, so I'm getting ready to sift a coat of enamel on top of this fine silver piece. I'm going to put my dusk mask on because this is airborne and this will be a wet process used with the uh, sprayer that I cannot live without one of those. So I'm using a hundred mesh sifter. I've put my quarter inside to make the grains dislodge from the holes in the mesh. Now. If I went and sprayed this right now, I'm going to activate all of that dried sunshine colors, and I don't want to do that. So the very first coat I put on this is just a light dry sift. And those dry grains that are sitting on top are going to protect it. So when I do spray and sift, spray and sift, I'm not re-wetting it that much. So small grain size, really important for clarity, and also for coating these edges so you have color that goes to the outside edges of this piece. It looks like I'm putting a lot on. I'm not because I've got the right grain size. Enamel on fine silver and sterling silver has a tendency to pull away from the edge, and that's just kind of a phenomenon. I call it it's kind of a sticky metal and it requires um, a little more attention to the edges to get it to lay over the side. I'm going to dry this on top of the kill and then we're going to fire this piece. And here's the piece right out of the kill. I decided to add another color of enamel on the outside edge to kind of shade the piece. So that was 2530 and uh, the beginning green on this was 2420. These are all Thompson unleaded enamels, and it's the ones that are particularly beautiful directly on with no flux on the bottom. They work really nicely on copper, but they're just gorgeous on silver also. The sunshine colors, because I put them underneath, the grain enamel acts like a blanket. So it will protect the sunshine colors, which really don't like to be high fired. So once you get the sunshine colors underneath a coat of grain enamel, then you can go in for repeated firings. You still don't want to overfire the piece, but uh, they will take more heat. Now we're on to our third piece in the neck piece series. We're starting on the third pendant shape and a different application of enamel. We have some very clean 2910, which is Elan Gray, which is a gorgeous color. And I'm just going to put that directly on top of the beautifully uh, patterned fine silver material. And that's probably the easiest application there is. So I'm going to get my mask on and start sifting. I'm using a surfactant again on the piece. I am really rubbing it in. Now the, the thing on patterned material, you have the opportunity to put too much surfactant on here because it's not a level piece of material. So be very sure that you're putting it on and you're taking it off because excess soap in the little crevices and grooves can create a problem if you have too much on there. Now if you think you're one of those people that puts too much on and you can't help yourself, the other thing you can do is just spray clear fire on here. So clear fire, as you can see, has a little bit of soap and when we spray it on the piece, I can rub that all over the piece and I'm applying a very thin coat of soap on my piece. Sometimes that's good for the very eager surfactant users. This is a beautiful gray. Uh, it's very elegant looking and when we put the rivets in in the rest of the video uh, we'll, we'll do something that maybe has a contrasting washer around it so we have um, several different color changes in there. So I've put about two coats on there. I think that's enough. I'll dry this on top of the kill and I'll be back. So 
Our third piece just came out of the kill. It's a beautiful Elan Gray. I put two coats on it to give it a little bit more vitality. And now we're going to start with the rivets for all three of our pendants. The tools we'll be using in, in this video at the end of it are these wonderful pieces of fine silver tubing. It's seamless, it's fine silver, and they make a gorgeous rivet with very little effort. And coincidentally, they match up these four of the smallest disc cutters. So you cut a hole with a disc cutter, then you can make a, a flared rivet for the top. We'll be using the disc cutter set again. We'll be using a saw frame that has a 2 aught saw blade in it so we can saw the tubing units apart. We have the tubing jig. We've got the Swanstrom disc cutter. We have a brass mallet. And then we've got eye and ear protection. So let's get started making these rivets. Uh, the first thing we're going to do so we can get some of the tools out of the way is to make a washer. So these disc cutters are perfect for that. This piece is going to have a, uh, I'm going to call it faux gold, but it's brass, but it looks gold enough for me. And I'm going to make a washer that's going to surround this piece on both sides, similar to what I did on this pendant. I'm going to select the hole, which is the center one. I think that's that guy. Okay. I'm going to put on my eye and ear protection. So this is a beautiful piece of textured brass, part of Cool Tools' extensive line of textured 2 by 6 uh, sheets. I'm going to put this upside down. I like to not look at the textured side. I like to keep that on the other side. This is the hole that I have in the pendant. I've got my shim on the other side and I'm going to make that hole in the center. I've got to make two of these washers for this pendant. And then I'm going to get a set of circle dividers to kind of tell where I am. I could just eyeball this if I wanted to. So what I'm trying to do is create a washer that will give me enough room that when I flare over the tubing rivet, I don't cover, cover the whole thing up. So I think this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh hole looks pretty good. And I'm only trying to remember this so I can do it again. I'm going to use a little lubricant on this. And there is our beautiful washer. And remember, brass is harder than copper, harder than silver. So this disc cutter cuts quite nicely through the material. I'm going to do the center hole one more time. Oops. Once again, lubricate the cutter. And then I'm just going to eyeball this under one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> that looks pretty good. So those are my little washers that will go around the tubing rivet to add just one more layer of material to my pendants. So let's get this stuff out of the way and start our fine silver tubing rivets. Now we're coming to the part where we need to fit the interior for the tubing rivets. Even though the disc cutters were approximately what we need, there's usually a little bit of fine tuning required 
to get this to fit in there a little better. So I've got a burr on here. It needs to be lubricated. I have on my eye protection because I'm grinding. And I'm just going to go around the interior of this just to enlarge it a little bit. In, uh, when you talk about rivets, the tighter the rivet, the easier it is to flare. You don't want a lot of play in between the tubing rivet and the piece. Let's see if this one fits. That's a good fit. And then the larger piece of tubing that is going to go into the big piece. That needs a little work on there. Wonderful. So this is what you want to look for. The washers that I've, I'm going to put on this piece also need to be enlarged a little bit because they were cut with the same disc cutter. So don't try to hold this in your hand in this manner with a flex shaft and a rotary tool here. If this gets out of your grip, you're going to cut your fingers. So this is my second and third hand in life is a set of parallel pliers. I adore these things. I have them in urethane. I have them in needle nose. But it's a, as our hands get older, we need to take a little more care of them. And this presses down in a uniform manner. So I can hold this in my hand very comfortably. Now, another thing I see people do a lot is they'll, they'll keep two parts moving. Well, that's just asking for a lot more work than you need. So if you have a bench pin here, brace it on the bench pin. That way you've got one thing that's not moving and you've got a piece that's moving. It makes it a lot easier. The same thing happens in filing. When people file pieces, they'll uh, file in the air like this. That's not very effective. So filing, same procedure. One stable object, one moving object. So now we have all of our pieces ready and we have tubing to cut out. So let me get ready for that. So these two pieces have the same internal tubing that's going to go through the center. And it would be great if I could just saw two out that are exactly the same. But unfortunately, or fortunately for this design project, I'm going to put the washers on either side of that. So the tubing that I saw out for this one is not going to be long enough for this one because I'm adding material. You need at least one millimeter extra on each side of this. And like I said in another tubing video, sometimes it's just easy to eyeball it. Saw one out, and if it works, then you can saw several out the same. So this looks about right to me, maybe three millimeters total, uh, one for each side of the rivet. And I've locked it in place, and if I needed to make several more for this particular size, I could go ahead and saw them. So a nice thing about doing repetitive projects, if I'm always working with this size of tubing, if I'm always working with this particular gauge of fine silver, and if I'm always putting about that much of enamel on it, I'll be using the same size over and over again. So it doesn't really change as long as you keep one constant in there. So you've got one millimeter on each side and an extra. So it does get easier. So even though this is fine silver tubing, we're going to anneal these after we've cut and uh, refined them. Fine silver does have some copper in it and it work hardens. And when you go to flaring this on top of your enamel that you've worked all day on, you want to be sure that it's going to flow over. So let's check my fit on the one that doesn't have. So. If you kind of eyeball that, you can see that I have a leading edge of about two millimeters. So that's great for this one. Let's get all of our sawing of the internals done. Now I'm going to start the tubing rivet for this piece. I've got 
24 gauge brass, two pieces of it, and then the regular thickness. So I know I have to increase my tubing rivet by just a little bit. So I've changed my gauge length and I'm going to saw this one out. The beauty part about having a washer underneath there is you don't have to be tender at all when you start flaring it. Brass is really strong. It's going to protect the enamel surface and it's going to accept the fine silver tubing that's on the top of it. People always say you're going to hit the enamel. Yeah, I'm going to hit the enamel. So let's see how close we got on this. And I'll just put all of them together. I just need to see if I have... Oh, perfect. Isn't life grand? So that looks like a two millimeter lead on the top of it, so I know that's going to work. So I've got my two smallest ones cut out, and now I need to accommodate the biggest one. So sometimes when we're using this larger tubing, it can't be accommodated in the jig that we were using. But there's a great tool that you've probably seen in the plumbing section of your hardware store if you hang out there like I do. And it's a pipe cutter. So from now on, we're calling this beautiful piece of silver pipe, and we're putting it in this uh, little pipe cutting jig. This would be very hard to hold in your hand. So this bench vise that clamps onto any table that you've got is perfect for holding this. It also rotates, so I could move this around. Watch me do this. I've got the perfect setting on here, and all I'm going to do is rotate my pipe. And it's going to loosen up, so I need to have the knob out here so I can continue to tighten it. It's got a little blade in there that's cutting the piece, and it shouldn't take long for it to go all the way around the fine silver tubing. Sometimes it comes out, and just reposition it, and you can figure out where the groove is on there and put it right back in. I'm trying not to clamp very hard on this. If, it, if this was a piece of copper, you would really put a whole lot of pressure on here because it wouldn't go anywhere. But this is fine silver. It will compress if I put too much pressure on it at one time. So I've got to be a little gentle. And look, there you go. Now, we do have to treat all this tubing. We've got a little bit of an edge on it. They need to be sanded because this is the last time we can get back in there and do any kind of refinement. So let me take my bench pin off and come over and show you the next technique. So before we join the rivet onto the enamel piece, we want to do a little sanding on both sides. And I think these uh, sanding sticks are just perfect. I've got the one that's the coarse. And I'm just going to go on both sides and file. And if you kind of do it in a little bit of a pattern, you won't do them, um, sand them so they're unlevel. But you want to keep filing on it that this little piece that's left in the center, that happens every time we saw, and you could see that little shard coming out of that. We want that off the piece before we join it to the enamel. So I'm going to go through the course for all of these. And then I'm going to use a finer sanding stick. You could do this on a sheet of sandpaper. Um, a great tip I had at one time was to take a regular sheet of sandpaper, uh, 8 and a half by 11, and you spray the whole back of it with that 3M mounting spray and you put the whole thing down on a piece of masonite or plexiglass, and then you've got this huge surface, you know where your 220 sandpaper is, and you can do your figure eight. So I'd probably be doing that at home on this. So this is probably, what does it say here? 100, 180 grit, and then I'm going to use a finer grit. So let's go up in grit sizes and we want a really nice shiny edge. So guess what's happening when I'm doing this? All of this fine silver is getting work hardened. 
and we're going to have to anneal the piece. But guess what? I always have a kill on because I enamel all the time. So I'm going to put this on uh, these little pieces on a sheet of mica, put them in the kill, and my kill is usually set at 1450. I'll just crack the door open and leave them in for about two minutes. If you wanted to turn it down, the perfect temperature would be between 900 and 1000 degrees. So when I'm annealing a lot of pieces, I will turn the temperature down on my kill so nothing melts. But you know, silver doesn't melt at 1450. So I've got all the kerfs off. These really look like nice shiny pieces and follow me to the kill and we'll put it on a sheet of mica. I have my tubing on a piece of mica. The reason I'm doing it on mica is because I may have some residual enamel that I've left on this firing rack. I don't want that to bond with the silver. So I want a nice clean product coming out. My kill is up to about 1300, 1350. And so if I just crack the door a little while and set a timer for about two minutes, I know I've annealed the piece. So now put on your ear protection and we're going to set these rivets. You saw the original set of rivet punches that we had. Well, those are too small for this. So how am I going to form a rivet with these? Well, that's what the dapping punches are good for. I'm going to select a size, and it really doesn't matter as long as it's bigger than the hole. You want to hold it nice and perpendicular to the piece. And I've got it on a really nice shiny bench block. And I'm just flaring it out just a little bit, enough that I can flip it over because I want to split the difference between the two sides. So don't get over eager on one side or you're not going to have anything left on the other. I go back and forth and back and forth. And if I see my rivet bending in a bad direction, I'll pick up a, a larger dapping punch. And we're getting very close to finishing. Now, when I've got it about even on both sides and it's still loose in the center, I can take a, a small rivet hammer and go around the edge. I might take a plastic mallet. If you do rivets as much as I do, you realize that one side of your rivet always looks better than the other, so be sure and put that on the side that's facing out. Oh, we're almost done. Now, the easiest rivet to do is on a base that's copper because it's very, very sturdy. Um, fine silver tends to get a few stress fractures in it. Isn't that beautiful? So right here I have a few stress fract fractures that have come up in the piece. I can put this whole thing in the kill and refire it. So I would take the opportunity to, to do that. Let's see how it goes on this one. I'm going to select a smaller Dapping punch, slightly flaring it out, I'm going to flip it over to the back side. So the smaller the rivet, the easier they are to do. Uh, the larger you get, it takes a little bit more skill and control on a piece. So in sushi eating, they would call this the challenging 
menu. It's a little challenging here. This one, not so much. So I'm starting to flare. If you can see the flare on that, I'm moving to a larger dapping punch. Like the first piece, when I see them both forming and folding down, then I'll get my urethane mallet out. You want it to get it tight enough that it doesn't move, so I need to apply a little bit more pressure. When I really want to close the edge of the rivet down so it doesn't catch and it doesn't rotate, so that's not completely set yet, I can get a, a wood dapping block punch. Great. Now we have the fun one that is a washer on the top and a washer on the bottom. So we want to flare just a little bit and we want to be able to still be able to orient these washers without, you know, tightening them up way over here. So that's the that's, uh, good Good hand skills, good hand skills here. When I'm trying to get the rivet to flare out, I need to have metal on metal. If you use softer um, riveting tools underneath here, let's say a, a piece of wood, a Delrin pad, or Delrin, you're not going to get much uh, forming. It's just going to bounce, and you're trying to get the pieces to go together. I'm almost to the point of, so I'm rechecking my orientation on these washers, and then I'm going to come in with a softer hammer so I can go directly on top. Same thing on the back. Oh, well that's just pretty. So there are our three pendants, all a little bit different, done with the same Richter pattern that I think is one of my favorites at Cool Tools. The same template was used, different size holes, tubing rivets, and a different way of treating a rivet by having sandwich material in between. I hope you've enjoyed this video with the various treatments for enamel, the sunshine colors, and also different ways of using the rivets. I hope you use one of them in your next project. Visit our learning center at cooltools.us for more cool jewelry making videos. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and be sure to sign up for our email list to be the first to hear about new videos, new products, and other cool stuff from Cool Tools.